So today's agenda is our first goes through the overview of machine learning, the application fields of machine learning. Then we will focus on one type of machine learning called supervised learning. And then at the end, we will have a small classification project we can do together. We always hear those terms, AI, machine learning, and deep learning, but what are they and how are they related? Uh, artificial intelligence is the broadest discipline of creating intelligent machines. And the ultimate goal is to create a machine that can think rationally and act rationally. And machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence and deep learning is uh, another subset of machine learning. The difference is machine learning uh, can learn from any existing knowledge and deep learning it requires a large data set and we're trained through a artificial neural network. Traditionally, when we uh, compute, we put in data and a program, we, we give the instructions to the computer and how they do step by step, then we get the outcome. But in machine learning, we have a task one to achieve and we put the data and the output we expected to the computer. And then the computer will give us the program, which is the model. And let's see what, uh, give you an example of what machine learning has achieved. Composed by Ava, a machine learning company. So how they train this model, they put in 
a lot of music scores and the styles as labels, then they train a huge deep learning neural network and then they obtain a model for, but still need human intervention. There must be engineers who enter what style of music they want to obtain, then they can create the different uh, product in the end. And besides music composing, they can also create beautiful, beautiful images. And this year is the year of rabbit. Look at this very detailedly drawn rabbits and they are having a very unique styles and they are all created by AI. If this is drawn by a real person, it will take a few days, but if it's joined by an AI, just take a few words and a few seconds. One of the famous uh, drawing machine learning product is called Imogen. It's created by Google. And for example, if I type teddy bear swimming at the Olympics, then this very realistic image come out. And it can also create refractive effects in the image, like the water in the library or in the gallery. And so it saves a lot of time for the artist. If they just, for many of uh, small magazine companies, they don't need to purchase uh, pictures from artists at all. They just create and edit the distortions a little bit, then they can use the image. However, there is a bit uh, copyright issue here. For some platform, they allow the users, uh, the creators to own their images, but some platforms still hold the copyright to themselves. And there are some, uh, another issue is when they train the model, some of the companies illegally take the unauthorized photos and paintings from the internet, which is not right, but uh, but most majority of them already give, are using the images that can be used. Also, there it was a big news last November. Do anybody know chat GPT here? Is uh, it's worth most powerful chatbot so far. And when it was released, uh, it was very, it's a big shock because it can do so many things. When you enter a sentence, uh, an instruction, like write a resume of me and give a little more details, then it, it can write for you. And if you want, to, want a story of a person named so-and-so, then age like 23, then it can write a, entire story for you. And this posed a challenge to high school English teachers. So many schools has banned the use of chat GPT. And also even uh, it can not only create articles, write passages, it can also write code. Um, however, it may not be super accurate as it has stated here. <laughs> This is what I take from the website. It is at its, its, its rich its capacity because many people want to try with it. And it's, and it admit that it cannot get 100% accuracy. And when people try to test it, it's very honest. When it reach certain questions, it can't answer, it will see, I'm sorry, I'm not able to browse the internet or access any external information beyond what I was trained on. But despite these limitations, the chat GPT and Ava, the music composer, and uh, the image are still very powerful tools. Do you think they can be called strong AI? Can you give me an answer, yes or no? Yes. Okay, let's answer this together later. Your answer is yes. Okay. So there was a test, there is a test called Turing test. 
uh, uh, many people may watch this movie called The Imitation Game. And the Imitation Game is another name for the Turing's test. Alan Turing uh, developed this Turing test in 1940. Uh, and this test is to evaluate whether a machine is possible to be to simulate human behavior so that people cannot differentiate it from human. And so there will be an interrogator and keep asking this machine a series of questions. And if this uh, interrogator cannot differentiate uh, whether this is a machine or human, means he think he is, this machine is a human, then this machine passed the test. If, if he realized that this could be a machine, it, it sounds like a machine's reply, then this machine is not intelligent enough. And uh, with time goes by, only testing the responses are not enough, good enough already, because we also need to test the machine's uh, visual uh, processing ability and audio processing ability. So in, so we have an extended Turing test now, and there is a competition held for testing uh, intelligent machines called a uh, Lobner com competition. And they are using this extended Turing test. However, there is someone called John Searle uh, questions the Turing test, I think it's not possible for machines to really think and understand things. And so they are not intelligent. And the key give a case called the Chinese room argument. If a person is sits in a closed room and and with he holds a Chinese book, uh phrase book and instructions, but he don't know Chinese at all. And there is another person sending inputs to this room, ask questions in Chinese and expecting a valid response. And this person, although he don't know Chinese, but he can read the book and give a, a possible response. And so it's like, if I give Gong Xi Fa Tai, then he said, he think it's a very good uh, words. Then I give a thank you note to the people outside. So will people think the this is an intelligent machine? Is that that does he really understand the question? Really understand the conversation? No. So John Saul thinks uh, this cannot be called an intelligent machine. He thinks the strong AI must require an actual mind must require consciousness and understanding. That's why what we have discussed, the AVA, chat GPT and uh, imaging are all not strong AI. They are just weak AIs. So, uh, so today's world, we haven't come up with the strong AI so far. But even with weak AI, we already have a lot of applications and AI can have a wide application and in automatic language translation, medical diagnosis, stock market trading, online fraud detection, virtual personal assistant, email spam and mobile filtering, self-driving cars, product recommendation, traffic prediction, speech recognition, and image recognition. There are many, many more applications. Generally speaking, uh, there are three types of machine learning. First is supervised learning, where we have labeled data and we use the, we fit the data and the label to the, ma to the machine. Then we get the label of new values. Uh, we are able to predict the label of new values when unseen data is given to the model and also unsupervised learning. The difference between unsupervised learning and supervised learning is unsupervised learning does not uh, given, 
data, uh, given the labels to the data. So um, it's called unsupervised because we do not know what's, do not need, we do not need the label information. They will identify the clusters among the data themselves, identify the unseen relationship between the data themselves. And the third one is called reinforcement learning. It will learn from mistakes when the robot is playing games. The model takes action in the environment, then receives state updates, and then get the feedback and learn how to act in the next step. So next, I will move into the most uh, interesting one. It's called supervised learning. As I have said, there will be labeled data and we fit the data into machines, then, then the model will train itself to understand the pattern and then the model can be used for prediction. So when we obtain a, a clean set of data, what do we do to it? For the training to be to happen, we we need to split the data into two parts. It's called training data and test data. If we don't have test data, we can't test whether the model is uh, performs well after the training. So besides these two, within the training data, we are going to have validation set. So while the model is training itself, it will validate against the validation set and then to modify it, modify itself and find parameters while training. And this is called the careful cross validation. This is one way to do the validation. Uh, in this example, the training data is split into five folds and at each time the the green four folds will be used as training data and the blue fold will be used as validation data i'm introducing this technical things because later in the coding part we will encounter such terms and these are all handled by the library called libraries themselves. We don't need to code in a code from scratch. So in the training, after training, we, we can predict actually entire process. The aim is to find the best predictor. And in order to find it, we need there is assumption that test data and training data are identically distributed. What does it mean? Is because the machine cannot recognize uh, unseen categories, and if they want to predict apple, it can't be that the training data doesn't have an apple. That's why uh, it's better for it to be identically distributed. So that the model can generalize well on, on the test data and give good results on the test data. There is another issue that often face in the uh, machine learning process, which is underfitting and overfitting. If we find a, to find a very good model, we are going to use uh, a matrix to measure its performance, maybe its accuracy, then we plot a graph to see how the accuracy changes. Overfitting is um, when the model is learned, uh, too, learned too well for the training data, like the third graph, it learned so well, it learned additional noises so it fits very good on the training data, but if I give another data, the data may not fall onto the line. 
and underfitting happens when there are too, too little information learned from the training data and there is no uh, experience learned. And one way to prevent underfit is to remove the out layers because out layer doesn't provide very useful information to the entire data site. So we can, we should remove it at the data cleaning stage. I will also give you uh, an explanation of the one very important aspect of supervised learning, which is deep learning neural networks. The all very, uh, the three examples given before uh, are all trained through deep learning neural networks. How does neural network look like? It's really a network. It, at the beginning, there are input layer, then uh, many layers of hidden layer. That's why we call it deep learning. And in the end, there is the output layer. And what is inside each hidden layer? It looks like this. This is an example of recurrent neural network. So firstly, the inputs are transformed into machine readable vectors. And then the network will take the sequence of vectors one by one and pass it through the network. I'm just giving an example. You don't need to understand it very well. Then there are two very commonly used uh, uh, machine learning algorithms uh, to process natural language and audio, which is uh, LSTM, long short term memory, and the GRU get it recurrent unit. So this is a zooming to the cell itself. What happens to the vectors when it reach each cell of the neural network? There are a lot of mathematical computations. So we the segment, uh, this red circle is what we call the activation function. And what does it do? It's, it's going to switch the vector into uh, between zero to one. So the not important stuff will time by zero, then it is forgotten. It is left behind in this network. It will not be carried forward to other cells. That's why this part is called a forget gate. So at each junction, they will do some modification or concatenation or addition. Then the useful data will continue to flow to the next cell, the next layer. Then in the end, we will get the result, which is the label we want to predict. There are many other activation functions that we can pick when we tune the models. Uh, let me give an example of using the LSTM model when doing a real uh, classification case. This is called named entity recognition. So yeah, it's also about Chinese. And we know that Chinese words are not separated by spaces and uh, one word can have multiple Chinese characters and that's why it is more difficult to do this named entity extraction recognition compared to using English. And in this project, our objective is to find all the name, organization, and job titles in the document. And in English text, we have obvious features that can indicate entity name, like capitalized terms and different tenses and article words. But in Chinese, though, we never change in all kinds of tense or part of speech. And almost every Chinese character can be part of an entity name. So we can't build a vocabulary for each kind of entity type. And entity name can be much longer than a word. So how do we fit this training data to the machine? Then we must create useful models. That's why we need to 
uh, find a good tagging scheme. Put label on the training data is a very important part of creating machine learning a project. Because if you don't have good data set, you can't even start. And so the, in my uh, research, I found three types of tagging schemes, which is part of speech tag labels each word with the part of speech. And ILBS schemes and ILB scheme. Uh, I stands for inside, O stands for other, B stands for begin, E stands for end, and S stands for single. So if we label it, it will look like, uh, like begin of person, inside of person, end of person, then others will be labeled as O, O, O. So do, can I have a guess which tagging scheme is the best? Yes. A close, very close. Okay. So in this case, I found out that IOBES is the best. It provides more information to the machine. It, it gives almost one label to each, it gives one label to each character. And when we fit the uh, list of labels and a list of words to the machine, it can learn better compared to part of speech. And you may wonder, how do we fit Chinese words or any words to the machine? Can it understand? And this is uh, how we do it. We put, because machines can only read numbers, digits. So we use vectors to represent the words. And there are existing libraries where uh, data scientists have created public available for us to use. And why we use vectors represent? And this vectors are, has very high dimension so that it can represent a lot of words and represent the sem sem semantic relationship between words. So if they have similar meanings, they, have sim they are in similar category, they are closer in the vector space. So in the end, we train the model uh, with pre-trained 100 dimension character vectors with the IOBES label. And then uh, to prevent overfitting to the training data, we randomly ignore some units in the dropout layer. Then we use the uh, state-of-the-art bi-directional LSTM to remember and the word representations can remember the previous and later word context in the process. And then we're adding more and more uh, layers to process word-wise representations to obtain scores for each tag. And in the end, there is a conditional random field to fix up label bias problem. Then we obtain the, obtain the entity names we want. I believe, uh, uh, we can have a short break uh, after you download something. I've prepared some code for you. Uh, this is a very uh, well-studied data set called Iris data set, Iris flower data set. So we are going to uh, differentiate, I classify these three types of these flowers and how do we Learn what should we learn about it is the width and the length of the petal and the sepal. Then we can differentiate all of them using the classification algorithm. So what I want you to do is go to this link on the page and download the ML workshop file and open it in your Google Drive.
And then after doing this, you can go for a break. Oh, wait. So we come back at 7.40, is it okay? All right, guys. So we are having a break now. So if you haven't taken the food right just now, right when you just came, there's like food outside. You can came. Sorry, you can went and like take it now. Only if you haven't taken it, ah, uh, don't take twice now. Uh, also, just like for your information, right? So actually, if you haven't realized, the link here is actually attached in the email that I have sent yesterday, in the confirmation email in the workshop. So you can just download. There's like a zip file. Then you can upload it to your Google Drive and open it in your Google Colab. But if you have Jupyter Notebook offline, you can also open it.
Testing, testing, testing. Wait, is this better? Uh, Devanch, Devanch, is this better? All right. Everybody, can you get seated? <laughs> and have, are you ready? Have you opened the notebook uh, in Google Drive? And it should be something like this. Okay, let's start. I hope you have some Python background. If not, uh, it's also okay because all code is given here. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. And we are using an environment called the Google Collaboratory. And this is a free Jupyter Notebook environment that runs on Google Cloud servers and user can leverage Google hardware like GPU and TPUs. Oh, these two stuff is something we can find here. In runtime, change runtime type, hardware accelerator. Uh, this, what, why do we need this? Because in machine learning, sometimes you, when you do deep learning neural networks, it train the data pass through so many layers, so many layers, so many calculations, so many calculations. Then we need something to speed up the speed up the training speed. And this uh, graphic processing units can do parallel processing. So they will speed up. But for our case, we don't need it. So we put none and save. So collaboratory, uh, short, uh, in short is collab. It can let you do everything you can do in the Jupyter Notebook uh, environment. And, and this is online ID. You can use it as long as you have uh, access to Google Drive. You don't need to install anything or set up in your, on your local machine. And within the Google Collab, it can operate like a uh, file. You can see this uh, file system. We can use shell commands in this, in this code cells. This is a notebook you can edit. You can add code cells or text cells. This is how I created this page. So before you do a machine learning uh, project, First thing you need environment set up. You need to install Python 3. Let's check what's the version of the Python in this environment. So it's already 3.8.16. Actually, Python has uh, no longer support Python 2. So on this platform, this is uh, there is only Python 3. Before, a few years back, you can choose between Python 2 and Python 3. And also when we uh, do the machine learning uh, project, we need a lot of libraries pre-installed. If we are doing on our local machine with Jupyter Notebook, then we will manually install a lot of libraries. But here uh, we can see there are a lot of pre-installed libraries on this platform. And the five key libraries we will need here is Spicy, NumPy, Pandas, uh, Matplotlab, and uh, Scikit-learn. And it's the same with ST-learn. Let's see whether they are on our platform. Spicy is used for scientific computing and the technical computing, and uh, includes modules of for op optimization, linear al algebra, inter integration, interpolation, and special functions. NumPy is used for working with arrays and matrices. Panda used for working with data sets. And it's called pandas because it's a, it refers to panda, a panel data and Python data analysis. And 
MATLAB is used for plotting, SKLearn is used for machine learning and statistical modeling. So a lot of models are from SKLearn. If we don't have the library we want on this platform, the way to install is this excellent exclam exclamation mark and pipe install spicy. Uh, the, here you put the library name you want. And you can't, you must put the exclamation mark in front, otherwise the collab cannot recognize. And if it's on your local machine, you can put uh, pip3 install, pip install. This is a way to check. Uh, we also need to import all this library first. After importing the library, then if we don't load the libraries, then we will need a very long description to call it from the library. So for convenience, we also load the libraries. For example, if I need the read CSV from pandas, then we from pandas import read CSV first. If we don't do this in the code, we will need to do pandas dot read CSV. But after importing, we only need read CSV. Uh, if it's a Python script, we put all these imports at the beginning, but actually on the collaboratory playground, when we play with it, we usually uh, put the imports just before at the beginning of each cell is more convenient. So we're going to use UCI machine learning repository uh, to obtain the Iris Flower dataset directly. We get the URL and we specify the column names. It has four attributes, sepo length, sepo width, petal length, petal width, and the label is its class. This is what we want to obtain from the model. And data set read CSV, we put URL and names equals names, and they will, and print data set head. We will see the first five rows of this data set. Oh, I put this magical thing, percentage, percentage time, then it will, put, will give us CPU time. If you don't, I, I just want to show you this. Then if you put a number in the bracket of head, you can specific, specify any number. We can put 20 if you want to see more, then you will, show, you will see more rows. And what's the shape of this data set? Oh, it contains 150 rows and five columns. That's why it's 150 uh, column, comma five. And there is a very simple function to describe it. You will receive the count entries, count of entries and mean of this attribute, uh, this feature and mean standard deviation and some percent house and its maximum number. When we check the class distribution, we can see they are evenly distributed among the three classes, all 50. This is good for, uh, for a machine learning project because if it's not evenly distributed, we call it unbalanced data. For unbalanced data, we need to, it's better to balance it, which means we do some, do some sampling to make the smaller minority a class to make it well to make it increase its number and for the majority class we need to decrease its number so that it become a balanced data set so we after we uh do our 
very simple analysis of the data. We also want to visualize it and see whether we can find some pattern. Let's see some whisker plot using that plot. That. You can also create a histogram for each output variable to get an idea of the distribution. But this are all uh, is for is the bit uh, uh, description for all of the data. So what if we want to see the differences between classes, differences? We can see that in certain, there was certain clear correlation between pedal length and pedal width. They are linearly related. There are also other ways to visualize data set. Shouldn't click this. Uh, oh, this is one way to load the data set. If we don't want to use URL, we can also load from our uh, Google Drive files. And this will need to connect to Google Drive. It's very convenient if you uh, put your data into the Google Drive file then, and you mount your file to the Google Drive, then you can use the environment like exactly the same as you use your local machine. And you can upload files from local machine to your Google Collab using this function. Another way to load this iris data, because this data is so widely used in uh, machine learning education. That's why it's also inside this Seaborn library. And this library is also pre-installed. It can create many uh, beautiful graphs. And we can see the class differences on this graph. We can see there are differences between these three um, classes, so it should be easy later for us to differentiate between them. The next step is to evaluate some algorithms. Firstly, uh, we separate out our validation data, Validation data set. Set up the test to use tenfold cross validation. This is what we mentioned in previously. Uh, and build multiple different models to predict species from flower measurements. Then we select the best model with the best matrix. First, we create the data set. We're using a uh, more import this string test split will help you to split the original uh, from the start are equals to data set values. We'll give all the values to the assigned to array. Then this is the uh, Python slicing representation. We are taking the first four rows as the features, which is X, and the last column, the fifth column, as the label, which is class Y. And uh, in Python, it starts from index starts from zero. That's why this is four, not five. And string test split will split them according to this text size. When you assign it to 0 0.2, it means I put 80% to train and 20% to test. And this random state uh, controls the shuffling process. 
if you put the fixed number here, then every time when you click this one, run this cell, click run this line, then the content of this four data are, should be the same, remain the same. Next, with the data, let's build models. Because we don't know which algorithm will be the best to this problem. So we need to try a few. So let's test six different algorithms. Actually, there are more than 100 machine learning algorithms. But when you use them more often, you will know which, what are the most suitable ones for different types of problems. And it's easy to import them using sklearn. And the setup is like this. We create a list here and append the model to the list so that later we can run a for loop. We use the stratified tenfold cross validation to estimate model accuracy. And this will split our data set into 10 paths, train on nine paths and test on one path, and repeat for all combination of train test splits. Uh, stratified means at each fold or split of the data set, we are aim to have the same distribution of sample by class as exists in the whole training data set. We are using the matrix of accuracy to evaluate models. So within the for loop, so the name is this, we, we put the first item we put in the list is the name of the algorithm and the second one, the, uh, algorithm, the model itself. So we for name and model in models, the list, for each item in the list, then we do this stratified tenfold cross validation. And with this cross validation results, it will uh, re refine the model. And at the end, we get the best score for this model. Let's have a try. Uh, oh, because I haven't. Your result may be very different uh, from, uh, will be different from mine, but very a bit only because the, it, it, there is something random inside the algorithm. The differences in numerical precision. And in this case, we can see that the support vector machine is the best, has the best accuracy score. And we can also create a plot of model evaluation result and compare. So it's very easy to see that SVM is the best at this time. The accuracy is the highest. So next step is to make and evaluate predictions. We must choose an algorithm to use and result in the previous section suggest SVM perhaps the most accurate model. So we used it as our final model. Now we want to get an idea of the accuracy of the model on our test set. And this gives us the independent final check on the accuracy of the best model. And it is valuable to keep a validation, the test set just in case you may overfit to the training set or there's a data leak. So both the validations, both the training accuracy and test accuracy are important in the process of model selection and especially the test accuracy. We use model fit, fit the training data and its label and then 
uh, use this model to predict the, the test data. And then we get the predictions, which is the, the Y, which we already have the uh, Y validation as the, the real class. And this predictions is the predicted Y value. And in the process, if you want to save the model and continue the project later, you can do a model save uh, when the driver is mounted. There were, then this model will be saved as a file, then you can re-import again later when you resume. And we can evaluate the predictions by comparing them to expected results in the real data. And we calculate the classification accuracy as well as confusion matrix and the classification report. We can see that the accuracy is 0 0.96, or about 96% uh, on the test set. And the confusion matrix provides an indication of the error made, which is this one. And finally, the classification report provides a breakdown of each class by precision, recall, and F1 score and support showing excellent results. Because this is a very small data set, it's likely the result is very good. Uh, we have come to the end of this workshop. Do you think it's uh, you have obtained the uh, you have learned something and you are able to make a machine learning project yourself? If you have any question, you can come and ask me uh, right now. All right, so do you guys have any questions for the speakers? Just raise your hand and you can always ask her. But if you are shy, you can always like come to approach her later because she'll be staying for a few minutes after this around. And you can just like come down and just approach her to ask about like machine learning or maybe ask like how to do machine learning in the hackathon and maybe some tips to win the hackathon itself. So I hope you guys learned something today about like machine learning and I hope this workshop is fun. And yeah, so thank you guys for coming today and let's put our hands together again for our speakers today. <laughs>